Welcome back to the Keep It or Change Cast podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Nash, as always. And again, I'm with Michael Pashit. How are you? I'm super good, Nikki. Hope you're always good. Today, I've got a particular smile on my face because when I leave here, I'm leaving for the airport. I'm flying to Durban okay. to do something that I don't think you will relate to, but many of our listeners and many of our viewers who were born in the 70s and early 80s will. Okay. What do you know about Night Rider? Nothing. <laughs> 100% point proven. But late in the show, we're going to talk a little bit about all things motoring. Okay. This is filming for all things motoring. I'm like a little boy excited, truly. Michael Knight, you're looking at him. <laughs> That's amazing. So today we're actually going to speak about a lot of things. And we received a few questions from our last podcast. And people are always wanting to know first car options, what to buy. And I think it's important that we speak about that because we've spoken about the whole finance route, used vehicles and other things time to talk about new entry level vehicles. x5s entry level porsches <laughs> entry level ferraris or no. do you want to go real entry level real entry level so vehicles under three hundred thousand rand. So, so basically just you work and you can afford a vehicle yeah now three hundred thousand rand is a superb number but what's interesting you said we receive a lot of questions if you say to me what question do i receive the most often believe it or not what car would you recommend that i buy first time out yes, now what is key for you when you're buying new first time new first time brand new i personally i, I need to look i need to like the look of the vehicle Correct. number one then i need to look, enjoy being inside the vehicle because that's where you spend most of your time as, as the owner and then because it's my first car and i'm taking out the whole petrol head side of, of me because my first car i need to be safe as well so i need to look at is the vehicle a target um so those are the type of things that i look at because it's my first car Worst case scenario, it gets stolen. I don't want to go through that process because that's extra money and I don't want to go through that route. So for me, you've identified the key. Just the thought of buying a brand new car, absolutely superb. Do you agree? Tick the box. 100%. But now I go buy a brand new car, but it's a car that I say, wow, did I make a mistake? I spent 180,000 rand. I spent 200,000 rand. I bought myself a little Toyota Vitz and you know I'm a huge Toyota fan. Yes. But it just doesn't talk to me. It's got a normally aspirated engine. It's slightly underpowered. So you spoke about 300,000 rand. Yes. I find at the moment 300,000 is the absolute key. Now when we talk about new for me, I'm going to bend uh, the rules. What is new? Brand new is obviously new. Yeah. 2023 with 30, 40,000 kilos, in your opinion, is that new? Not necessarily new, but it's close to being new. Correct. Different so you're going to be correct. buying the latest shape, low kilos. I've got two cars for me that stand out. Okay. Everybody always goes Suzuki, and I love Suzuki. <laughs> Who doesn't rate Suzuki? There's two cars that stand out. One is not a Polo. And the other is not a Suzuki. Can you guess what I'm thinking of? It's uh, close to a Suzuki. It's one size fits all for me. One size fits all. So it's not a Suzuki. It's not. A but it's Suzuki. close to a Suzuki. It's like kind of like a Suzuki. It's just a little bit better. Hmm. I don't want to say Toyota Starlet because you're going to have to say Toyota Starlet. Oh, so you think of Toyota Starlet? Absolutely. Okay. You've got the small Toyota, but it's not the entry level Toyota. Toyota Vitz. Hundred percent. I think it looks amazing. What am I renting this afternoon when I get to Durban? A Toyota Starlet. Without a shadow of doubt, <laughs> by luck or by uh, request. By request. Absolutely. That car, up to you. Do you like manual? Go for manual. Do you like auto? One other car, Hyundai i twenty. Now, the reason I asked you about new, you're not going to find a Hyundai i20 brand new for 300,000 Rand, but a nice 2023 with 30,000 kilos, 300,000 Rand. Tell me that that is not a cut above. It is, and it is because it is, when you look at uh, Hyundai, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the service plan and the Correct. warranty and all that, Hyundai, if I'm not mistaken, offers a seven year thing. So if a vehicle has 30,000 Ks, that means the vehicle has only been to two services and you still have, if it's a 2023 model or even 2022, you still have five years on, 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 on your warranty. So that's a very compelling compelling choice that you put on. The now we way. said it's a first car. I buy the car, it's a 2023 model, bought a new in 2023 by the previous owner, warranty till 2030. Am I going to keep that car for six, seven years? Highly unlikely. Yeah, it's unlikely. my first car. I'm going to move up quickly. But I want to sell that car in two or three years' time. It's still got three or four years' worth of warranty. How difficult is it going to be to sell a beautiful Hyundai with low kilos that's still under warranty? And that's oh, why that's it's good. always what you do today 
will come back to reward or punish you. Now, you go buy a car today and you say, you know what? I've got a budget of 300,000 Rand. I'm not listening to anything Michael and Nikki says. I'm going to buy myself a 3 Series, an Audi A4, a Mercedes C Class because it's within my budget. What kind of mileage will a 300,000 uh, Rand uh, C Class have? 120, 130, 140? Nothing under 100,000 Rand. 100, 100 kilos. That car is going to hurt you on maintenance. When you come to sell it, people are going to say, the way you say, near bra. I'm not touching this car. You shouldn't have bought it two years ago. In the first place, I'm not yeah. going to be the idiot who buys it today. Anything else in that category that uh, strikes you? So for me, I think of Suzuki. Definitely the Beleno. I think of the Beleno because the Beleno is slightly cheaper than the Toyota Starlet. I think it'll buy 10,000 Rand cheaper. Why? Because it's the same vehicle and I don't think Toyota is allowed to price it exactly the same as the Suzuki. Cause Brand cachet. More. I've got a Suzuki or I've got a Toyota. It's just Toyota. perceived higher. Yeah. Okay. Food lovers market, I think, are an exceptional store. Are they Woolworths? No. Do they offer the same type of uh, product? Yes. Woolworths, Toyota, <laughs> food lovers market, Suzuki. So Somebody's not going to be happy with me and somebody's going to love me. 100%. Then another vehicle that I kind of thought about and uh, looking at, it's a new, new vehicle. It's another Suzuki, um, just getting launched um, in November, but it's currently out now, so people can buy it, is the new Suzuki Swift. So they've went, so if you like a Swift as, as a whole, because you see a lot of Swifts on the road. So now it's a whole new model. Now, as a buyer, you need to find yourself, where do you like the, where, which one do you like the most, between a Swift and a Berlin or a Starlet? Because the new Swift, is starts at 240,000 Rand and for a GLX model 1.2, if it's CVT, the automatic, you're looking at this around 285. Incredible. So the pricing is right on top of the Starlet and the Beleno. And depending on the type of person you are, you can look at those options. But I would look at the bigger, the, very the, the good bro, option. Now, option. something I'll pride myself on if I don't know something about a product, will I offer an opinion or will I pretend to know? No. Or will I say straight out I don't know? Yes, as you don't I know. know the Suzuki Swift is getting a facelift or a new model. New model. I haven't seen it in the flesh. I haven't seen anything about it. Okay. What we do know is the Suzuki Swift was the absolute go-to. Yeah. People were looking for a car, 180 to 200, 220, whatever the case may be. What about a Suzuki, Suzuki Swift? Swift? What is the big differences between the new one and the old one? Because I'll tell you what I didn't like about the old one after you tell me. So I think off the top of my head, because I'm, I'm also, I've am i only seen it um, when I went to the dealership and I was taking my long-term Suzuki Franks for some issues to get fixed. I saw it. So the main difference is up front, obviously, exterior has been changed up. Interior has been changed up to how the new Belenos and the new Starlets okay, look. Okay, that's the key so, for me. So there's a big upgrade in terms of interior. And then I see they've, well, I saw the Change Cars website. It says um, 1.2 CVT. So I think they've moved away from the four-speed automatic to a CVT gearbox. And then I think they also moved from a, a former four-cylinder um, 1.2 to a three-cylinder, something along those lines. That's what the guy at the dealership was telling me. Okay. Now, three-cylinder don't let it ever scare you. The way engines are evolving, truly, everything is going smaller. Yeah. The old four-speed automatic was acceptable, but slightly antiquated. You know, I'm not remotely against CVT. I think CVT is absolutely unbelievable. But what I didn't like about the old uh, Swift was that interior. Yes. For me, it looked like mass-produced, which it was. That's why it was priced so well. But it was cheap and nasty. It had no tactile quality. The plastics felt just cheap. It felt what we think of, and you know, you're not allowed to say Chinese with me. <laughs> it's what I would have considered a 2010 Chinese product, not a 2020s Japanese product. Would you agree or disagree on terms of the interior? Yeah, I think off the top of my head, I think the interior was something that needed a big, a big upgrade. And I'm glad with the new vehicle, the interior is getting a big upgrade. For so, sure. Now, we spoke about 300,000 Rand. How come you haven't mentioned electric vehicles? So before we go, <laughs> there's, one, there's, there's something that, you, that caught my attention there when you were speaking about not a VW. I want us to touch on, because there's people that are watching, like, why not a Polo Vivo? Because Polo Vivo is in and around the same price. So you, I give you 300,000 Rand, buy your first vehicle. Or you're buying your Sanjay in a, a vehicle. Why wouldn't you buy a Polo Vivo? What are your... Yeah. So, it's well known that I'm a Toyota fan. I'm a huge VW admirer. It's a quality German product. It's one of those brands that is liked universally, male or female, all age groups, all race groups. However, it's got one more fan base. A fan base that is far bigger than any of those other groups combined, <laughs> and that is a theft. I used to say, is it so real or is it just uh, exaggerated? 
This week alone, promise you not a word of lies, this week alone, three people that I know that have had their Polo Vivo stolen. It's got to stop somewhere. Now, stolen. Touch wood, not hijacked. But there is a huge component. If you speak to the tracking companies, we're busy speaking to a major plane, a tracking company regarding coming on board with all things motoring. They said, VW Polo, absolute no-go. I've got enough angst as a parent, and I don't have an 18-year-old, but when my 18-year-olds just learn to drive, now they're going out the so-called jawling. Okay, not going to be drinking, but where are they going? I don't know. I can't control it. Now I've got a car that is an absolute target. Okay, we always say you can be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You could be in a Renault Clio, which is not a target, but wrong place, wrong, wrong time. time. However, you come in with a Polo, the wrong eyes are potentially on you. It doesn't matter if it's in Soweto. doesn't matter if it's in Santon. doesn't matter if it's in Cape Town. doesn't matter if it's in Clagstorp. The eyes are on that car. Would you agree with me? Yeah, hundred percent. It's. Uh, I think that goes around all polos, even just not just the Polo Viva, even the, the the bigger one, the, the normal polo. So I think it's something that as buyers you need to be cons- need to think about. Like this is a vehicle that is high risk because it's famous. So it's something that's popular, unfortunately, will get taken. I've just come up with an idea. Puja, you need to contact VW. Tell them you want to buy the rights to the uh, polo. Call it a Puja Player. <laughs> polo player, you know, remember the polo player, polo player yes, and see yes. if it gets stolen as well. I don't think people will be stealing Peugeots. Yeah, they don't. Excellent car. It's critical that we always mention that we are not dissing a brand. When we say I wouldn't buy a VW Polo, let's be honest. VW, the Polo, you've done so well. Yeah. Your success has led to the challenge. It's not because it's a horrible car. It's because it's an appealing, good-looking car, and that is where the challenges come in. Doing Huge well. VW fan. It's just the same thing as like your Toyota Hiluxes, your Toyota Fortunas, because they're doing so well, it becomes a target. Now, I was in Namibia last weekend. We were filming. Okay. If I say to you, you think Toyota Hilux is popular in South Africa, mm-hmm. okay, you have seen nothing yet. Whereas in South Africa, if you're driving on the highway or you go to Kruger, it will be Hilux, Ranger, Ranger, Hilux, etc. There it's like Hilux, 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 Hilux. Looks like a Ford. No, it's not. Sorry, it's an old shape Hilux. Hilux, Hilux, Hilux. Ah, there is a Ranger. Toyota dominate in that country. What do you think the theft risk is of Hiluxes in Namibia? I don't think there's... Round figure. I have no idea. Zero. Just not an event. Hilux, Toyota, the brand, is thriving there for all the right reasons. What was unique for me in Vintuk, luxury German cars. Okay. okay, when we say luxury German, let's use VW, let's use Audi, let's use BMW, let's use Mercedes. Okay. You only see one brand of those and not en masse. So let me explain. Like, yeah, you go to Santon, you go to Cape Town, you go to Mschlange. Luxury German cars are the norm. There, they stand out. Only one make. The other three, non-existent. Which one? BMW? Nope. Audi? Nope. Mercedes? Mercedes. Wow. If you take a lot of people in Namibia, they are of German descent, as in there's a large German community there. Okay. okay. You speak to them about BMW. BMW, no, 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 not no, nine and Audi, no, only Mercedes, only Mercedes. That was the answer I got. Okay. So if my uh, accent is not great, forgive me. I just did my <laughs> best. That's how it was told to me. But Mercedes, super popular, or Mercedes. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable, but it's just interesting that there's not an emphasis on luxury German. It's only an emphasis on quality. Hence, I say again, Toyota, hats off to you. You're shining, and there's no negatives there. So, moving from budget vehicles, let's speak about vehicles that have a very. They need to prove themselves in, into the country, and it's not just the brand; it's Mazda. vehicles as a whole. Mazda. <laughs> not Mazda. Uh, <laughs> but, I um, wanted, but I want to talk to you about Mazda later. Yeah, we'll definitely hop, hop onto Mazda later. So I'm speaking about vehicles as a whole, as in EV vehicles. So those that don't know what EV stands for, it's electric vehicles. So obviously when a new vehicle, electric vehicle gets launched in the country, people are always saying, we don't need this, we're not ready for this in the country, there's not enough infrastructure, I can't do long distance trips in the vehicles, all of that stuff. What's your thoughts about electric vehicles in the country? One thing that stands out for me is the way they look. If you say to me, every brand that is making EV, Audi, BMW, Mercedes, BYD, GAC, can you fault the way these vehicles look? I think they look superb. 100%. However, 
the definitive uh, guiding light. Take any journalist around the world. When I say journalist, I'm talking about major names. Your Jeremy Clarkson's, Tiff Nadell. What is their view on EV? Have you found one? Don't need to give me two. Have you found one that likes EV? No. Included. Now, without contradicting myself, I spoke uh, last week. I said how I loved the BYD. Absolutely fantastic. Well-priced, new. When it comes in second-hand, it's going to be exceptionally well-priced. But the challenges of owning an EV for me are just too many. We always talk about SCOM. We're not even joking about SCOM. 100%. That component, no problem. I'm at home. I'll plug it in the wall. It will get charged. But I need to go anywhere for whatever reason. I don't know if it's just mental or S for luck. Every time I get in my car, I need to fill up. I don't know if it's the same with you. Every time I look at my fuel gauge, I don't know how. I don't know if it's evaporating overnight, I but know. I need to fill up. I know how. <laughs> you have a heavy foot. <laughs> That's his story and he's sticking to it. Who are you going to believe? <laughs> but for me, I'm in a hurry. I've got 20 minutes to get to an appointment. I leave for the appointment 3 o'clock. I leave at 25 to 3. No problem. I've got that extra five minutes. Hi, guys. 1,095, please. Ah, maybe that's why. Because 1,095 is only putting in 20 liters. That's why. <laughs> I've worked it out now. <laughs> but how long does it take me to fill my tank to what I need? Three minutes? Four yeah. minutes? Including the car transaction? Now, I need to do that in a hurry. Because for whatever reason, I've used a car this morning. I haven't had a chance to charge it fully overnight. Blah, blah, blah. Can I do that? No, no, you can't. Now, I don't have another car. What are my alternatives? Uber, Bolt. Hmm. I personally don't see EV ever taking off like they envisaged. Volvo always spoke about the end of ICE engines by X year. Have they changed that? Have they gone back on that? I don't know. They have. Many of the manufacturers, Audi, Volvo, they had these deadlines self-imposed where there was going to be no more ICE engines, i.e. internal combustion engines. I think Volvo did say, I think 2026 was the uh, first time they spoke about it. 100%, and then 2030, oh, yes, and now let's make it 2,135. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. Electric vehicles, they've got incredible characteristics. We know the performance. We know they're relatively cheap to run, high, to, uh, to, to high cost of initial purchase. But what is a logical reason? for an EV. I don't get it. I really don't get it. Yeah. And I can see big problems coming three, four, five, six, seven years from now with those batteries. I think they will be replaced under warranty by the manufacturers because they will have to. Because if they don't, and somebody says, you know, I just spent 65,000 rand on a battery, no one will ever buy a new EV. A new okay. EV. But I see safety issues coming. How safe is an EV vehicle going to be, God forbid, in a serious crash, serious side-on, serious uh, semi-frontal, full-frontal, heavy rear collision. Who knows? If two EVs crashed into each other, okay? Bite okay. my tongue. I'm not wishing anybody bad. But we live in a real world. What's going to happen? Hmm, that's actually a good, a good scenario that you put there. All Things Motoring would like to demonstrate two <laughs> EVs crashing with crash test dummies. If you've got two EVs you don't like, call us. I really do see problems coming. Yeah, I just think it's an unknown store. My main concern um, above what you just mentioned is the whole distance in terms of some electric vehicles, you're looking at 300 Ks on a range, some 400, some 500. I think at most currently in the country, you're looking at like 500, 600. And that is so under ideal circumstances, yeah, under ideal driving with a light foot and everything going according to plan. 100%. Take off 20% of that. 400, I believe, is realistic. If I said to you, Nikki, we're undertaking a long trip, what is the maximum you will feel comfortable with? It wouldn't be over 400 for me, would it be for you? To travel? On, on an EV, on one, on one full charge? No, no, definitely under 400. Okay. I, would, I, would, I wouldn't want to do a trip that has 400 Ks. Okay. There's heavy traffic, and I'm overtaking truck after truck after truck, exactly. and all of a sudden, just, absolutely. And I think about where I'm from. So for those that are watching, I'm from Vanda Limpopo, and I stay in Pretoria. So if I had an EV, when I leave and I hit the N1 North, there's only one charging station, which is in PLK, Bolokwan. Right. Now, I've had EVs on test. I've got, mm -hmm. into, I've got into a charging station and the station is not working. Or there's oh, load shading, the stations are off. 
or I try to tap the card, it's not working. Yeah. Then I'd have to move from the station to a station, the MBS 5K is down the road. Yeah. So now my main concern right now is I bought an EV. Okay, the EV does 400Ks. From Pretoria to PLK, it's I'm fine. 200. I'm fine. I'll just charge when I get to PLK, then drive back. Over a long lunch, uh, like seven hours. <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah. I think an hour or so. But my main concern is what if I get to PLK it's and, not and it's not working? Then what? Or there's two, or I don't know how many charging stations they got, or there's two, three others. It's just uh, bad luck on the day. But now you spoke about vendor. You go to Vendor, you go to Lutrichard, you go to Guiani, you go to any of those towns around there. You've got exactly zero chance, zero. right? Are you ever going to have a situation where you're going to take it to the informal car wash and they're going to have charging stations there? Never. Not going to happen. Never. Now, forgive me, and I should know, can you have a mobile charging station, your own, that you carry with you in the boot, or is it just no, very no, difficult? No, no. no it can't. Um, it's, it's not powerful enough. Um, to charge the vehicle because there's some vehicles that some electric vehicles that you can't they just say I'm parked here and then I take an extension from the house to outside then not, not powerful enough you're losing too much enough. so it needs like a proper wall socket so it needs like a wall socket and all those type of things to consider so I think it's fair to say if any company is looking for an ambassador for EV Nikki Michael <laughs> Jeremy Clarkson Tufta <laughs> Dow Vicky Butler Henderson we are not uh, the role models. We're, we're not the people. Not but the people. Let's go for a break and then we come back. We're going to finish up a topic that Michael actually wants to speak about so bad. <laughs> Need advice? Visit changecars.co.za and click on the Keep It or Change Cars tab. Welcome back to the Keep It or Change Cars podcast. We went on a break. And just before the break, there was a particular topic you want to speak about, and that's Mazda. And funny enough, I'm actually test driving a Mazda right now. Which one? Uh, the Mazda CX-30 Black Edition. Now, you're going to think during this conversation I'm wearing two hats or I'm schizophrenic. Let me start. Okay. Tell me that it's not a magnificent car. It is. I love it. The CX-30, the CX-60, etc. just unbelievable. 100%. But what is it about Mazda in South Africa that they are not doing what they should do? It is one brand that I'll go on record and saying I think they have got out and out the worst marketing team period they've got a product that is equal to anybody let's start with the product mazda product what are the weaknesses weaknesses not having a turbo i think that's what a lot of people always complain about i think that's on their, on their petrol ver- on their on petrol the, on, the, yeah. on the petrol versions yeah definitely not having a um uh the turbo but other than that i can't really think of any other i think they've got a relatively narrow product range but what they've got the cx30 for example the cx60 superb but you speak to people about mazda and it's almost like wow i didn't even consider that i think their pricing is on the high side but that is not a negative the reason their pricing is on the high side I see Mazda as a premium Japanese brand. It we is. spoke earlier about Suzuki. Suzuki, I think, is a lower end, ultra successful, deservedly so, but it's not premium. There's nothing about a Suzuki that's premium. For me, everything about Mazda is premium. I said I'm going to Durban and I'm uh, renting a Toyota. In Australia, in December, when I go there, take a guess what I'm renting. Honest truth. A Toyota? No. A Mazda. Mazda. Best value for money, and I like the Mazda product. But what is my negative towards Mazda? Nobody knows they're around. You try to communicate with their marketing team. They are incredibly unhelpful, disinterested. Then they've launched a new campaign, this unlimited kilometer warranty. Have you seen that? No, no, no I haven't seen that. Okay. Well, right now, so you haven't seen it. Number no, no. one, they've launched that as a knee-jerk reaction. Hyundai and Kia for years have had that seven-year warranty. Seven year warranty. Who doesn't know about it? Everyone knows about it. The right. Hyundai Avenue, everyone knows about it. And it's Every been single person you. knows about it, and it's doing them a lot of favors. When it comes to Mazda, you see any advert from Mazda, it looks like, okay, guys, what can we do to be radically different because we've stuffed it up so badly for the last couple of years? I'm truly vehemently anti the product, and I'm anti the marketing team. Just because of the way they conduct themselves, talk about ourselves personally. So remember, in life, anything is about your perception. You go to a steers, you have the most incredible meal. What do you say about steers? I love it. You have a 
terrible experience at Steers, at Chicken Licken, at McDonald's, wherever it may be, what do you say? You don't like it because of experience. 100%. Now, you take a brand like Mazda that is definitely not setting the world on fire. They need every bit of help. When they purposely take an approach that is anti-working with somebody, I've got to call them out on it. And guess what I'm doing? Calling them out. Calling them out on it. And I go back to the car that you're driving. Tell us about the car. What are the positives about that? Because there are many. Yeah, I mean, for me, it looks good, especially because I have it in, in, in that red color. It looks good. It drives well as well. And it feels, like you're saying, very premium inside. It's a very nice car to be in. Which is not what you'd automatically associate with Japanese. Quality, absolutely. Take Lexus, okay? Toyota and Lexus. For me, Lexus is premium. Mazda doesn't have a Lexus brand. Nissan had Infinity. Yeah. Honda have Acura. Mazda don't have that. Why? Because they're premium themselves. Correct. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. You've got such a good product, but yet it's like the world's best kept secret. I get people phoning me and they'll ask me what little SUV would I recommend. And I will. I'll recommend a CX-30. And I go, wow, okay. I never thought of that. Didn't even think about that. But tell me, where are Mazda dealers? Are they around still? Yes, they're very much around. But because of Mazda marketing, the best kept secret. So I, I think the marketing team for me personally, I think they need to do a lot more into showing the Mazda brand in the country because Mazda is a very good vehicle. And I'll touch on about that just in a bit because there's such an influx of the Asian guys coming into the country. And they're coming in cheaper, but quality-wise, they're not where Mazda is in terms of their interior. So well, they're, they're definitely not superior to. Yes. In many, many ways, they're there or thereabouts. Perceived quality. When I say yeah. perceived quality, look and feel, the, the look of the leather, the gadgets, absolutely there. However, Mazda has got proper premium, premium, premium quality. And, that, and speaking about that, because I currently also have a, 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 a cherry to go for for pro on test right now and when i was leaving the house coming here i was you like had a choice i was like okay what do you want to be in for because i live in pretoria we're shooting on the way this side i'm thinking like okay now where the traffic heading back for me there's going to be traffic what would i rather be in nikki you're a visionary you are thinking is michael going to want to talk about cherry or is michael <laughs> going to want to talk about mazda come on take the credit a, vi a visionary yeah. but you've just proven the point in the most positive way have i once said that Mazda is not a good product. The no, exact no. opposite. Excellent, excellent, excellent product that is being done a total disservice by the current marketing team. And I think the MD of Mazda himself is just uh, led by his marketing team. He, uh, he's got no clue. If I say to you, is the MD of Mazda, would you have a clue? <laughs> And, yeah. I sh and I should know such information. Hundred hundred percent. Let that be a guiding light. Let that be a guiding light for any manufacturer. Whatever you do, don't alienate the public. Don't alienate the journalists. Don't alienate people who fundamentally like your product. When you are arrogant, and I say again, the Mazda marketing team is arrogant, but they've got zero reason to be arrogant. If they were arrogant because of their sales success. Toyota, are they arrogant? Not at all. Suzuki, are they arrogant? Far from it. Do they have sales success? 100%. Absolutely. So how do you balance the two? You've got arrogance with no success, and basically what I consider almost bordering on uh, letting the brand in Japan down. If I was Mazda in Japan, I would look at South Africa and say, in the 70s, we had the Mazda 323. Oh, it did well America. right up to the 2000s. Yep. We had incredible products. Remember, the marketing teams are, in a roundabout way, responsible for choosing what brands come in. When something doesn't work, bin it. When something is going to work, bring it in. People are calling for certain products that Mazda don't have. So do you think they also had, a, in terms of deciding which cars come into the country, like I'm thinking about the CX-60, did they have a choice on whether to bring the 2.5 litre petrol they first up. or they the 2.3 up. litre first? Of course they had a choice. So their rationale, from what I understand, was the 3.3 turbo diesel was too expensive. So what do we do? We come in with a cheaper, more affordable option that nobody wants. Every person who drove that petrol version, what was the one comment they made? The Underpowered. Engine. Underpowered, yeah, it wasn't. When I think of that car today, looks good, but what sticks in my mind? The engine. 
un- underpowered. underpowered. That is a superb, superb car. What four-door, almost sedan, almost SUV, proper crossover, perfect balance. That Mazda CX-60 is a brilliant car. I love it. And okay. I, I had one on test last week, actually, the 3.3 liter. I was like, oh, you know what? What is the I kilowatts on that? Different. Roughly 185 or a little bit more? 187. 187? 550 Newton meters. And now, any oof. car that's got over 450 Newton meters of torque. 400 is a nice number. 450, 500, 550 is proper. proper. It must be an incredible balance. I actually 100%. haven't had the pleasure of driving one, but everybody that I've spoken to that has driven one has waxed the recall. Yeah, it makes you think twice. Like, Because I had the 2.5 on test last year. Drove it and I felt like I'd rather be in the diesel CX, CX-5. I'd rather be in that than that. Now I had the 3.3 liter the, the past week. I was mm-hmm. like, I'd rather be in this than an X3, than a GLC. Now... Just because of just the engine alone, I've changed my mind in terms of either going lower or higher. It's such a good offer in that vehicle. I love it so much. Now, we've spoken about making the wrong choice. Let's just look <coughs> at Nissan and Toyota for one second. The Toyota Land Cruiser, the 300. Incredible. Two engines, petrol and turbo diesel. Which one is ultimately the better seller? Turbo diesel. Of course. Always going to be like that. Perceives better fuel consumption, yeah. more pulling power, etc. Nissan have got a patrol that is a superb vehicle. It can and should compete with the Toyota Land Cruiser. I've said it before. It in Australia, it. in North America, it does. They're bringing a new patrol out that is going to be drop dead gorgeous. I love it. Which diesel engine are they bringing? I don't know. It's easy. They're not. <laughs> you've got the right choice of engine and we say we're not doing it guys what time would you like to go see a movie either 8 or 10 o'clock okay let's start the late movie at half past 6 on a Saturday night idiots are you going to succeed is the movie house going to uh, do well with movies at 6.30 as their last showing not at all hence why go back to Mazda you bring out a big body a car that's costing approaching a million rand do you expect it to have Proper performance, yes. Are you going to have that from a, what was it, the four-cylinder petrol four engine? Four-cylinder petrol engine, 2.5 litre, naturally aspirated. Nissan yeah. X-Trail, talking to you, you've tried the 2.5 litre four-cylinder petrol. You've tried it for too long, failed. So again, shout out to Mazda, So what engine listen is, and look. What engine is Nissan bringing on the petrol? It's going to be a 3.3 litre twin turbo, so similar to the Toyota Land Cruiser oh. petrol. Listen, it's going to be stonking performance. They've got to bring a, bring a diesel. You've got to diesel. have a diesel. It's very, very easy. I invite you. I promise you, I'm not giving you analogies for the sake of analogies. I invite you to my wedding. Most people want beef. Most people love lamb, right or wrong. Mm-hmm. But is it fair to say you're going to have certain people who are vegetarians? You're going to have certain people who like chicken. You take any uh, function... You've only got beef, you've only got lamb, you don't have chicken, you don't have vegetarian. Are you going to keep everybody happy? No, you're not. Of course. So when you Nissan, when you Mazda, when you Toyota, say, we believe the diesel will be more popular, but there's always going to be 30% who want petrol. You've got that option. Give them that. But when you don't give them that option, you're that's pulling a, a bad, bad move. Mm, that's, that's a very good point you put out there. And I think they need to... Do something about it. Otherwise, they're going to find themselves with the other vehicles and not be in the country anymore. The easiest way to do something about it is two things. One, apply common sense and logic. And then when you need to go a little bit further, investigate. Say, what does the market desire? And if 5%, 7%, 12%, I'm talking about a small percentage, or 70%, a large percentage, want a certain product, give it to them. The moment you don't have that, you have a challenge. If Toyota tomorrow said, we've got a Hilux double cab, tick the box, doing well. We've got a Hilux single cab, tick the box, doing well. And they took one of the two and discontinued them. Only one of the two. The other one, sales will plummet. Because a company who's using a single cab Hilux for their workforce, the owner is driving a Hilux double cab. Now he says, wait a second. I can't get a single cab Hilux anymore. I've got to go to Ford because they offer a single cab. Next time he wants to buy a double cab, what's he buying? A Ford. 
hundred percent. And I know these seem like crazy analogies. Just make sure you don't have a weak link. Again, back to you, Mazda. Your weak link is your marketing department. So actually speaking about you, there's something you just said now, like you need to look at the market, understand everything and then start something or go with that. Speaking about something you're very proud of, um, I can see you smile at your face says it all. Thank you. All things motoring, the TV show. We, we know the website, uh, now on the TV show. Tell me how that started. Why did you start it? What made you start it? So June 2021, we started Change Cars up against absolute monster brands that were doing superbly well, well-established brands. I can openly share the name, cars.co.za, Auto Trader. How do you compete against brands? The way you compete against them is not to go head-to-head. -head. If you go head-to-head, -head, if you are a Chinese brand and you decide, to, I'm going to go head-to-head -head with BMW, you're going to see your backside. Because why? BMW have got a massive head start and they've got a population that loves them. So what you do is you compete with them differently. You come in at a lower price point. You offer more tech, etc. You offer potentially less risk. You don't compete with them head on. Yeah. So even though you are competing with them head on in theory because you're going for the same audience, you don't be perceived to be competing, competing with them head on. We started the TV show so that we could put a face to the brand. And that face, it was unfortunately, you. was me. Some people say a face for radio. I like to think a face for TV. When people can associate a person with a brand, do you believe, in your opinion, that it adds value? Yeah, it adds value. Because now you know who the person behind the brand is and you feel one with the person. And that's what it is. So we've always said you can go into our website, uh, my name, my contact details will be there. The TV show started a year later. Okay. Change cars, June 2021. All things motoring, June 2022. You may think, why did it take a year? You've got to build up the courage to go onto TV. <laughs> now... In November, we will be airing our 100th episode. Okay. Now, if you take Top Gear, Jeremy Clarkson, uh, James and Richard, together, I believe they did about 220 episodes. So if you consider that we're 40, 45 percent of the way there in a short period of time, I don't say it with arrogance, I say it with pride. You indicated, Mike, you love it. Why do I love it so much? What, what for you would uh, be the reason Michael Bushett loves doing all things motoring? Um, because you're connecting with the audience. I think that's your most favorite Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And, and I promise you, we don't say this to say the right thing or it's pre-arranged. It's very, very simple. All Things Motoring is about showcasing three things. Our beautiful country, our beautiful cars, and our beautiful people. Now, there are many road test websites and there are many YouTube channels that all they do is they test cars. Does it work? You look at Matt Watson from Carwell. Definitely, definitely works. He's got millions of subscribers. Yep. But what for me works is going to Nikki, going to Johan, going to Marlene, going to Pam, going to Rishi, and letting Rishi tell me his story. And what is his story? His story is a car that he's had for seven, eight, nine, ten years, that he cherished all his life uh, to try and get one. He bought it from his neighbor. That is what All Things Motoring is about. Telling stories. And... Another smile on my face. Okay. Why am I smiling about telling stories? You tell me. I don't know. All things. Oh, the new. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> so can I, do I have permission to share that? Yes, you do. So about building a brand, all things motoring is our brand. People associate all things motoring with a TV show. Now we're going to bring you all things. Give you a simple example, all things finance, all things insurance, all things tires, all things modified, all things performance, all things 4x4. What it will allow us to do is you as a consumer to learn about a brand in a specific sphere. So let's go to finance. Who is, in your opinion, the biggest brand uh, in South Africa when it comes to vehicle finance? West Bank. Out and out. They are identifiably, in my opinion, the best. When I think of West Bank, I think of the Wheels Bank. Take a guess. All Things Finance proudly brought to you by? The Wheels Bank. And it is going to be West Bank. We always, and I say it with no arrogance, will target the best. When it comes to insurance, 
we've got a specific company that we're going after. When it comes to vehicle tracking, we've got a specific company that we're going after. If, however, you feel that you are the right company for a specific thing, all things fuel, contact us. And again, I use a term, I don't say it with arrogance. We would love to work with you to showcase your story. Nikki, you take any brand in South Africa. Give me a major fuel brand. Anyone. Shell. Shell, absolutely. Engine, Shell, Sassel, BP, Astron. Do you think everybody knows about them or it's just something that's been around for a long time? They're not all the same, believe it or not. Each brand has got a uniqueness. It's got a unique history. It's got a unique footprint in South Africa. Do Sassel and Engine and Shell have the same amount of petrol stations across South Africa? Definitely not. 100%. We are going to change the way the public relates to a brand. Now, as we grow older, as you get a new generation, I think the love and the focus on a specific brand has dissipated. So 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you speak about your dad. Was he BMW, absolutely BMW loyal? Would yeah. he change from BMW today if the right car caught his eye? Today? Yeah, I'd like to think so because of the way he speaks about the cars I get on okay. test. Now, BMW, you know I like the brand. If BMW made your dad feel that uh, Mr. Nechefefe, you are part of the family and you're going to never leave this family. Here's your loyalty card, here's your happy birthday message, etc. Would he then change or would he say, nothing's going to get me away from this brand? No, he wouldn't change. All things, we'd like to tell your story. Very simply, visit the All Things Motoring website, my name, my number, Francisco, who's heading up all things. His name, his number is there. We'd love to work with you. You spoke about today. You said you're leaving today. You're flying out to Durban. <laughs> What's that about? What's my name? Michael. Mikey. First name, Michael. <laughs> What's my Michael. surname? Push it. Anybody who watched uh, TV in the 1980s will remember the incredible series called Knight Rider. It was about Michael Knight who was born, I probably this is in my head, who was born Michael Long and then he had an accident and they remodeled his face okay. and they gave him a very special car called Kit. Kit stood for Knight Industries 2000. Four weeks ago, I get an email from a gentleman, Unbin in Durban. He says, I'd like to invite you to come film in Durban next time you're here okay. and you're doing a feature on Knight Rider. He's built a 1982, because that's what the car is, Pontiac Trans Am. Mm. Now, only followers of Smokey the Bandit and Knight Rider will remember that name, Pontiac Trans Am. Black car, the computer, it's AI, all AI, okay. the car will talk to me. So one of the things that you always would see in Knight Rider was Michael, the driver, and the car could drive itself, by the way, okay. talking to his watch, and it'd be like this. Hey, buddy, I need your help here. This is a bit of a dangerous area. Come fetch me. And then Kit, the car, would drive itself. Come fetch Michael. Open the door. So if I'm excited or if I look like <laughs> I'm excited, forgive me. It is going to be the highlight of my filming career. So that's why you're going down to Durban. That's why we're going down to Durban. Saturday evening, going to spend some time with Melanie. Sunday, going to go for a swim in the sea. Do you enjoy the beach? Yes, I do. Really? I mean, that's. Yeah, I, I, I mean, enjoy being there. I don't yeah. enjoy going in. I just enjoy being Well, that's there. what you'd expect from a guy who grew up in Venda, right <laughs> Right there by the sea. About, what, what's the closest to sea? Obviously, Durban. Yeah. How, how far is KZN from uh, Limpopo? 900 kilos? From where I'm from, over 1,000, eh? Because from Pretoria to where I'm from, Venda, you're looking at just over 450. So Nothing. Yeah, a thousand. Did you say a thousand? Nothing like a swim in a swimming pool as far as he's concerned. <laughs> yeah, a swim in a swimming pool. But this has been another great episode. 100%. What is absolute key for me is a feedback that we're getting from the audience. Yes. Would yes. you say the same for you? Yes, 100%. I love the feedback. Guys, if you're watching this episode and there's things that you'd love to say, you'd like us to touch on about, comment. I read the comments and believe it or not, he actually reads them Absolutely. as well. There's some comments that I don't see. He will see. He will tell Correct. me about them. And we'll always respond to your comments. And if you want us to air a question on the, ch on, on the channel, just let us know. And we'll speak about it. Everything. We'll speak about anything you guys want us, want us to speak about. Our main focus here is you guys. Helping you guys if you need help. And educating you guys. And if you guys 
want to educate us on things we don't know 100%. Now, we said it before, 2024. I do not believe there's a mistake that you as a consumer, a vehicle buyer, an individual can make in cars, in life, etc. if you ask the right person. A mistake that you make is born out of not saying, wait a second, I don't know the answer, I'm going to take a chance. No, sir or ma'am. You don't know the answer, don't take a chance. We might not know the answer, however, we will find, we'll find the right answer. So till next week. I'm Nikki Nash from Sucha South Africa in power coverage to change cars and all things more change. And I'm Michael Knight. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. When you see the episode, you'll believe me. He's Michael Knight. I'm actually going to want to watch this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch. But thank you guys for watching. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe to the Keep It A Change Cars podcast, Switch Off South Africa and the All Things Motoring YouTube channel. We are growing there. We are approaching 2,500 um, subscribers. And then, yeah, on those podcasts, we're going to 1,000. Let's get to 1,000 before the year end. I'll be happy. Thank you guys for watching. I'm signing out.